I want to take a moment to welcome everyone to the Aldridge Contemporary Art Museum, even though we're holding this talk virtually. The Aldridge is located in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and was founded by Larry Aldridge in 1964. The museum is dedicated to the presentation of contemporary art, uh, and we are also a non-collecting institution, which means we have constantly changing exhibitions. Our exhibitions and programs focus on artists and their ideas, and we often show the first museum exhibition, significant exhibitions of established artists, and select group exhibitions. I'm really delighted to welcome and introduce Amy Smith-Stewart. Amy is our senior curator at the Aldridge Museum, and she will be introducing our guest of honor tonight and current exhibiting artist, Lucia Hero. Welcome, Amy, and welcome, Lucia. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Namulin, and welcome, everyone. And I also want to thank my colleague, Caitlin, for running the PowerPoint tonight. And of course, um, the biggest thanks to Lucia for this incredible exhibition and for joining uh, me tonight to talk about it. So um, I'm just gonna quickly introduce the exhibition and then we'll launch in. Um, Marginal Cost is Lucia Yarrow's first institutional exhibition. It spans a room scale mural and monumental sculpture that confronts 21st century capitalism through an intersectional lens. Appropriating imagery ranging from commerce to art history, she combines process with politics as she mixes lived experience with a material engagement that reclaims the languages of pop art, minimalism, and traditional European still life painting to diversify it. A first generation Dominican American New Yorker, Yero surveys power, opportunity, and individual expression specific to the community she orbits. She lifts visual matter off streets and media outlets to generate suggestive storylines that speak to the elasticity of identity. Her dimensional collages fuse hand-built and digital methods with a conceptual art practice that asserts her Dominican heritage and diasporic context to decentralize a Western-centric art canon and affirm a multi-perspectival worldview. The exhibition unites three distinctive bodies of work, the market series from 2014 onwards, as well as a new sculpture series, The Gates, and one of her most ambitious wall murals to date, which is titled after the show. And both the gates and the mural are specially commissioned by the Aldridge. Shaped by personal and collective remembrance, these works together share narratives about kinship, devotion, struggle, and repair. Lucia Yarrow was born in 1987 in New York City. She received a BFA from SUNY Purchase in 2010 and an MFA from the Yale School of Art in 2013. Her work has been included in solo and group exhibitions at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling, the Elizabeth D. Gallery, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, Jeffrey Deitch in Los Angeles, Sean Horton Presents in Dallas, and Primary Projects in Miami. Her work can also be found in public inclu collections, including J.P. Morgan Chase, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, and the Rennie Collection in Vancouver. New and recent sculptures from her ongoing rack series are also included in the El Museo del Barrio Triennial 2021, currently on view. She will also have her first solo exhibition in Los Angeles in September at the Charlie James Gallery, and will present her first outdoor work at various small fires, also in LA. So welcome, Lucia. I'm so glad to be joined with you tonight. I'm so glad to be here. So um, I wanted to start with, I guess, what we would say is the very beginning. Um, you grew up in a very creative household. Um, your father is a notable singer-songwriter, your mother's a vocalist, and your brother, one of your brothers, is an illustrator who, be, who turned into to a musician. When did you discover that you wanted to be a visual artist? Um, I'd say that, that with all that around me at home, um, it was sort of like in the, in the works that I was going to be an artist. I mean, even if I ended up um, doing anything else, I think all that creativity uh, was just a part of, of who all of us were in that house. And um, 
I think I, I really got serious more so at the end of, of high school uh, where, where I sort of made that decision for myself. And I think it was mostly a, a curiosity um, after visiting uh, the studio of, of Miguel Luciano, um, who's a really great Puerto Rican artist uh, with the Cooper Union Saturday program. Um, it was a it was an after school sort of style program that was held on Saturdays um, to get us prepared for for what college art school would be like. And when I saw his studio, I think it it was this big light bulb moment where I was like, maybe I can do this. And how can I sort of shadow this person and other artists like this person to to see if this is like a viable thing for me to do and. I was always making things and I was always really creative, but I think um, seeing that was really the, the turning point. And then, um, you know, I think I mentioned this in the introduction, but I know that a lot of your work is informed by your own communities, the communities that you grew up around, the communities that you work in now. And, um, you know, Washington Heights, where you grew up, is, is home to one of the largest Dominican diasporas in the country. And then you also spent three of your teenage years in the Dominican Republic. And I just, um, and maybe Caitlin, you can show the first slide. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how those experiences, these kind of intersecting diasporas um, kind of flowing um, have informed the content um, in your work as, as you developed from, you know, a, a student at Yale to now. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the work started in, in undergrad in a way, or at least the, the sort of investigations that I that I started began um, in college, and I had I had a really great mentor uh, who basically um, showed me how to look around and and really be be present because he's like everything that where where you come from and, and your context and all of that is is highly important in your studio practice. And um, it was, he, was, he was really good at uh, showing us that it wasn't just opening a book and, you know, and landing our finger on something and going, this is, this is what I'm gonna do, but that, um, that we were actively seeking, that we were actively looking around and uh, noticing things that maybe you know, maybe one artist had, had looked at it a certain way, but how, how could you bring something different? What are you bringing to that conversation? And I think that, that, that I carried that with me when I, when I got to Yale. And um, it's a, as, you, as you mentioned, it's such, a, it's such an amazing place, Washington Heights, because uh, it really does, once you, once you sort of travel to the Dominican Republic and, and you come back, it really does all sort of make sense. You start to realize that in a, in a city that can feel so divided at times from one block to the next, um, it, because I, I always said there, there really were two Washington Heights and I think still to this day there are, um, where you have sort of these gated communities and then you have uh, these these very large sprawling Dominican communities. Um, I I would note those differences mostly because my mother worked in those gated communities, and I would go and help her out. But I I also noted that in in a way, in order to belong, you know, they had to bring a little bit of home to create belonging, to create a sense of of um, you know, we're, we are here um, for, their, for, for everybody. And so everything from a bodega to a hair salon to the way that a supermarket is stocked um, is serving that, that direct community. And 
and going, okay, so maybe you don't feel like you belong in certain parts of the city, but you certainly belong here. And, and so I, I started to, to pick up on that um, with some of my early paintings in, in undergrad and even in some, some early performance uh, work, which, which I think started to push me more towards sculpture. But um, when I got to Yale, being away from, being away from home, um, I started to know also the little pockets of Dominican communities in New Haven and things like that. And, and the similarities that they had to, to Washington Heights or maybe the, the subtle differences and things like that. And, um, yeah, and, and I, got, I got really curious about that aspect. Yeah, and I remember you telling me um, that a lot of your work also, or especially the, Mer the Mercado body of work, which we're looking at right now, was also informed by a memory of your mother and your grandmother kind of bringing consumer items or I guess souvenirs as well that were specific to New York or specific to the to DR and this way of transporting them back and forth, but you know, when they traveled. Yeah, I I I always say that those were the first um, sort of entrepreneurial <laughs> things that I that I witnessed was just seeing um, all right, let's just fill up this one bag with all of these things, um, you know, cheap finds and like products and and things that you you might find in the Dominican Republic, maybe a little bit more expensive than um, than here. Uh, and and they would bring they would bring this one extra bag and sometimes give away things for free. Other times um, they'd be selling things or whatever that is in, in the DR. And, um, and then, you know, you'd get all these requests from people always as you were traveling and actually coming back to, you know, people here would, would be nostalgic for something and, and they would ask, oh, can you bring a little, you know, can you bring a little sweet? Can you bring a little something? And, um, and bringing that back. And so that trade of, of things, the, the initial, I remember the initial idea that I, that I had was to sort of have them in, in these sort of suitcase style things. But the tote bag came from, from thinking of, of the tote bag as a souvenir, as um, a lot of New Yorkers move around the city, I would notice them um, carrying these tote bags that, that really were an extension of their personality or something that they had to put. you could tell where they shopped or where they visited or from these from these tote bags and and worn as a sort of um, as a signifier and you know so I could I could tell a fellow artist when when they were wearing you know a, a MoMA bag or like a you know Guggenheim bag or something or if they were a museum employee you can tell and, um, and I found those things really interesting and especially uh, I used, to, I used to love these like kind of niche things like the, like the drama bookstore or something. You could tell that this person is either a playwright or an actor or, you know, you don't go there unless you're, you're one of those things. And, um, and so I, I took that idea and, and was thinking about how we, how, what the relationship was to, to the arts in the Dominican Republic or to the culture itself. Um, it really is so, dependent on, on tourism and uh, that, that a lot of the art is not really um, looked, on, looked upon as, as, as we would any other art anywhere else. I think that's a, that's a problem with the Caribbean in, in general um, or the way that people view the Caribbean. Um, and so instead of thinking of, of art art as a souvenir um, in, the, in the case of sweet beans um, there's a painting inside and, and in a sense then that turns into the souvenir that that master painting isn't just thrown in with all the other things well I think that's really interesting to jump in there let's let's talk about sweet beans which is the is the pink tote bag um, there that you see this Philippe Rousseau still life painting kind of tucked inside. But 
you know, maybe talk about um, the other, you know, the other items in the bag, um, because I do think that this speaks really wonderfully um, to the way that you're kind of handpicking or selecting um, objects that have, you know, a diversity of significance or importance, but all traffic and some kind of popular appeal. And it really speaks to how we are all interconnected. Um, it's really, I think about a fusion of kind of cultural net worth and, um, you know, also the, yeah. So speak a little bit about that. Cause I love the generosity in your work and the way that you create access points um, for people that are coming into an exhibition from um, a different, perhaps a different cultural vantage point. Yeah, um, so the, the work, those specific works were meant to um, kind of speak to, to, to different audiences and um, they did have different entry points. I think the Philippe, the Philippe Rousseau painting is uh, an entry point for, for some viewers that may not um, necessarily have a connection to the other to the other items in the bag, and and so they start to want to make a connection between these things. And and what's funny is that there may or may not be one, right? And um, but I think that the push to want the, the push to want to do that is a really interesting um, place that I I really love in in. in in observing the way that people, you know, encounter the work, um, but the bag itself, you know, it's a, it's a, the the items in it are ingredients for a dessert that's made uh, specifically during like holiday seasons, like in big batches, and um, which we call vitrola con dulce, sweet beans. It's like very, it's very sweet condensed milk. Um, it sounds like it would not be a, a really delicious dessert, but it really is. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I had picked the things that I feel, um, I'd, I'd see my mom choose for, for it here in the States. There's a few products that are used in the Dominican Republic. I think the Ligo and the Rica and things like that and Nestle are very much a part of, um, the way that the products that people use in the, in the Dominican Republic. Um, and I think, you know, Goya is such an inter interesting thing um, for, me, for many reasons. Um, Goya is a really interesting thing because it's, it's sort of a blanket product for um, the Latinx population. And so I think that in that, then there are viewers that connect to it and feel Oh, this is this is very me. I mean, I could name fifty artists from different parts of um, Latin America and the Caribbean that are that are using these types of like logoed works um, in their own work, and and I find that really interesting because then it's it it sort of speaks to the way that we're marketed to, and um, and how much of our how much of our identities are are really a construct of, of marketing. I know, and I also think, I mean, maybe when we go on and look at some of the other bags, I think it also speaks to that kind of conflict that we all have, like not sometimes what we, what we purchase or what we buy is not necessarily aligned with our political beliefs or what we want to believe in. <laughs> so I think also, um, I love the way that these works, you know, speak to that actually, to those con those kind of those conflicts, um, which sometimes are very specific to a generation or very specific to the neighborhood that we live in, or what, you know, what is what is available to us, um, class and so forth. Um, but maybe that's a good segue to talk a little bit about the title of the exhibition, Marginal Costs. Because I know you said on many occasions that your work is is fundamentally about economies, um, and I thought I thought maybe you could uh, talk about why you chose that title and um, its meaning, because it's also the title of this very ambitious wall mural that we'll see soon in the other gallery. 
Yeah, um, so I think that for a while I was making, I was making work that was, that was about my community and my people from a very personal um, and nostalgic sort of place when I, when I was in school. And I think that in observing the way that people were consuming that work uh, and consuming work by, by other peers of color, um, I, I was a little bit concerned. <laughs> and so I, I, I came to a realization quickly that I couldn't, that I just didn't want to make that type of work, that I, I, I couldn't, living in the world that we live in, 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 in this stage, in this late stage capitalist world that we live in, that that wasn't the work that I felt comfortable making. And um, and so I moved. I moved towards how do I talk about um, the sort of political underlying thing in the work um, in a way that's both kind of sardonic, but is also you know like I I didn't want it all to just be this earnest like and here's my culture because that felt very much like feeding into. The, the sort of voyeurism that, that, that tourism um, brings with it. And, um, and, so, and so I thought, no, I have, to, I have to sort of implicate myself as well, right, as, as a consumer. And I have to, I have to like push, push those buttons of, um, I'm, not, I'm not making, I'm not prying into like what each of these companies does and, and in the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, or, or any of these places, right? Like I'm not quite doing that, but it will make you think about those things quite a bit because these brands um, are, it, it's, so, it's so heavy, like that you see those brands and you know exactly like that they're, that they're these like mega beasts of companies, right? And, and so I thought, oh, the work can sort of do that on its own for itself. And, um, and so in thinking about that, I was thinking about the fact that when we talk about the economy, we talk about this like larger entity that um, a, lot of, a lot of folks that are um, quote unquote in the margins feel that they're not a part of that conversation, that that's just a, that's this big thing and our thing is this like day-to-day -day hustle that it's a sort of hand over fist like we do these things over here and there's this other big thing that we call the economy when in fact these these sort of smaller um transactions that happen in these like smaller neighborhoods and pockets and whatever are the things that keep this like big beast afloat and um and once i i sort of had that not epiphanies, I, I knew it, but it was just sort of like, okay, I need to, I need to sort of think about this. Um, I, I called up a friend of mine, uh, Tahir Karmali, who's a great artist, but started off in, um, in finance and tech. And, and I called him and we discussed this and he's like, oh, you're talking about economies of scale. And, and, and so we started thinking about titles and also, breaking down not just their their meaning in economic terms because i think that uh with these sort of conversations about about products and companies and businesses and whatever the human aspect is left out purposefully right like as if these things magically appear there as if there there aren't inhumane practices as if there aren't um you know, environmental and sociopolitical like ramifications to to the ways in which we're producing, and 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 what necessitates these these workers to to enter into these these modes of production, and so from there, uh, 
Tahir, Tahir came up with marginal costs and we, and we talked about it quite a bit because I was like, all right, explain it to me like I am a first grader. <laughs> and, um, and once he did, it, it was one of those things where I couldn't, I couldn't stop reading about um, the ways in which some things could be shown to be so beneficial, right? Like everything from, from Apple to, to whatever, like they, they have a really beautiful front on what they do. And for the most part do give back a lot, but that's only because they take away so much. And, and that transaction and that economy like really, um, really fascinates me. And so I, I felt that yes, it's about um, Washington Heights, but, but how does that sort of also look outward? So thinking from the micro and, and, and its effects in, in the macro. So that, that's where that title came. Caitlin, can we go to the next uh, slide? Okay, this is another, I think, I think this is evidence is what you've been talking about, but um, this is another tote uh, work in the Mercado series. And um, this is filled actually with what is now becoming, and I think there are some other instances or reverberations of this, but what is becoming really like kind of a relic, um, which is the grocery circular, because now that everything's moving online. But again, um, there's kind of an autobiographical resonance in this work, because I remember you telling me that, that um, you know, your mother collected these and relied on, on these, as did mine, <laughs> oldest of five children, for weekly shopping. And you know, um, I think that this also um, is a way to bring in your mother because she is a seamstress, as was your grandmother. And um, can you talk a little bit about how you begun to work? I think it was in your last year at Yale um, with fabrics and printing, you know, digitally onto fabrics and how you moved from because you were trained as a painter from two to three dimensions. Um, and you know, these are made out of a polyorgandy, they're body scale, but they're intentionally transparent so we can actually see what is inside them. So um, I guess we should just tell the audience a little bit more about how you started working with fabrics and also how these works are made. Yeah, so the, the fabric came in um, my last year uh, at Yale, as you mentioned, um, with another body of work called the, the New Yorker series. Um, again, thinking about uh, sort of privileged knowledge and, and, uh, and sort of class, class differences. And um, I started printing because I was making physical collages with, with paper and, uh, and I, I had also gotten a shipment of felt that that I didn't know what to do with yet. And so I had this great um, conversation with somebody that worked in the digital media department at Yale, uh, this fantastic artist named Ken Lavelle. And he suggested, he's like, hey, you know, I have this material that's kind of like felt if you want to start bringing these collages sort of to life in, in another material. And, um, and I, 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 it was like instant light bulb, like, wait, I can print photographically on these things and and not just you know because because there's the the photo transfer thing but this is just you know straight through a digital printer um so the immediacy of it was was really something that uh that I cared for not not in a sort of like lazy way because I think that's there's like there's an aspect of that 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 can sometimes be looked at that way, but it's then it gets turned into quite a labor intensive process. Um, but just the, the, the quickness really mimics sort of the thing that I'm, that I'm talking about. And so, uh, so I, I started printing mostly images for, for, from the New Yorker and collaging on top of them and, and, and thinking 2D. So I was still, in a kind of painterly mindset and and I still very much so use that language. I don't think I have the language of sculpture in, you know, 
I'm not I'm not that knowledgeable about um, the ways in which people talk about sculpture within an academic setting. I mean, I, I, I definitely went to go see a lot of my peers um, critiques and things like that when I was in school, but but that's not a thing that that I was really trained to do. And and so my ways of looking and analyzing at work are, work are still heavy, heavily influenced by painting. And so when I moved to, to making the bags, um, it was a little difficult for me because I still wanted, I still wanted some sort of hybrid, like 2D, 3D thing. So the bags are, yes, they're three dimensional, but um, there are aspects of them that are, that are super flat. Like these images are, are flat and are on um, very thin foam. So like, it's, it's still a, it's still alluding to a sort of 2D space. Um, and the, when I started sewing, I remember calling my mother and, uh, and telling her that this is, I was gonna start doing this now. And she was, she was really excited about it because she had always wanted to teach me how to sew, but I, I, never, I never wanted to learn mostly because I had seen that that was a, that that was a thing that, that my family did sort of out of struggle and, and they were trying, you know, this was this other, I didn't realize, I think till, till later when, when one of my aunts and my mother herself told me that my grandmother um, wanted to be a, a fashion designer and she never got to be that. And, um, and so it took on this other meaning sort of like, oh, well, I get to do this really creative thing with it. I'm not laboring in a factory. Like I get to I get to do what I want with this and express myself with this, and, um, and so she came into the studio. I I think it was right right in 2014. I had just left uh, Yado residency, and and I called her and was like, all right, I have this little space and let's let's get to work in there. And so she, you know, she sat me down and was like teaching me a lot of little technical things with machines and like. You know, how do you get these corners just right? And how do you do this thing? And then I had to break her out of a lot of that too. Cause I was like, well, how can you make it more expressive? How does it not look perfect? How does it look like this is a line, like a pencil line as opposed to, you know, a, a perfectly sewn factory line. And, um, and she started having a lot of fun with it. And I would show her art books and showed her Oldenburg and was showing her all this stuff and she, she got really excited about it, and um, and so the I remember when we first made the circulars bag, I had uh, a bunch of these circulars because I myself was using a lot of them, and um, and it was sort of a no brainer to sort of fill a bag with with these things with the thing that you're going to go and purchase more things to put in. Um, yes, a, a true circular. Yeah, a circular economy. <laughs> Um, Caitlin, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, this is exciting because you know you evolved from the totes, and of course, the tote bag in New York City. If you ride the subway, which I know is a, a huge source of inspiration, also for you, Lucia. Um, you know, you see kind of you know advertisement for various you know magazines like the New Yorker, but also various like galleries, and so you really get kind of get a hint at. Uh, it kind of hints to class or at least to an individual experience. Um, but then you evolved into the single use plastic bag, which, you know, was recently banned in New York. Um, and these are really, um, I remember you telling me, are based on kind of photos you take of people within your neighborhoods. You walk a lot. I know you're really inspired by what you see in your neighborhoods and on your walks. And I know that a lot of these works, and as you can see, especially with the work um, Mandao Paramanda, that they are portraits in a way um, of people you know. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I so the, the, the picture before this was somebody coming into my building uh, who I know, and and so he had gone to the the sort of street market, street vendors, which is why it's a Walmart bag, because um, they'll just have 
a bunch of single use plastic bags and we'll recycle them and use them, you know, for, for, their, for their selling of produce and stuff on the street. And so um, this is sort of one of many, I tend to not share that many because I always feel kind of, I feel weird about that. I'm like, this is a, I invaded somebody's privacy while I was following them around at the supermarket. And um, there, there was a time where I was like picking up receipts where I would pick up people's like dropped receipts and I could see the things that they would buy. And, and they were so, you know, they told, they told such a little story about like, you know, what's a reoccurring purchase? Like what's a, um, that was another thing that I started doing was like, oh, what happens if I go back every Monday or, you know, which is always like, I, I used to call them, you know, my admin days. Now every day is my admin day, but, but my, my Mondays were, were specifically that. And so I go, okay, so I'm gonna go in the morning and see who goes to shop Monday mornings. And then I would check out some Saturdays. Or, um, and you would see the same people and buying similar things and you, you bump into people. And, um, and sometimes I'd go in and I'd buy like one thing just to, just to buy one thing and not look like a complete creep in the supermarket. And, and I'd take these little snapshots of either people's carts or, or what was on the, the little conveyor belt. Um, and it was, and it was, you know, these are, these are common um, and very reoccurring things. And especially in little bodegas that have a little bit of produce and things like that. When you're, when you're also in neighborhoods that have um, very few supermarkets nearby, this is where the bodega brought the colmado, which is the bodega equivalent in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, the colmado is a really interesting place in the DR because it's a, it's a social space. It's where people gather. Um, you can actually buy a beer in a, in a, in a bodega in, in, in DR and sit down. They have like a, a, a little booth area where you can just sit and have a beer. And um, now young people are, are taking that idea even further. They have um, in, in the colonial zone, or as uh, young folks call it, La Zona, the zone in, in, in DR, um, they take those colmados and, and turn them into poetry reading spaces. So, or, you know, they'll, they'll have somebody spinning records like some days and have parties inside of them because you can just buy stuff there and, and hang out. So there's, there's that social aspect um, that then is sort of brought to New York where you do have the music playing and you have people come in that that will talk sports or politics or whatever and buy their scratch offs and hang out and and there's a there's a there's a sense of um, a community and then you also have that other little thing that if you really if you know the the bodega owner and he knows that, that you live nearby and that you're a regular um, that you start little tabs with 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 these folks and my dad certainly had a tab um, as a musician there were there were bad months and so uh i i remember him definitely you know sending me to the bodega and going hey get a couple things tell him to put it on on my tab and, um and so in some of these bags what you'll also get are these like sort of mini inserts and moments of of my of my shopping um habits and, and experience which is Sometimes I'll be I'll be reading something and um, and shopping or whatever, and so that magazine ends up in the same bag as all my other groceries or whatever. So the one on the left has a New Yorker, and um, the one on the right has an Economist, uh, which is for for a friend Amanda Uribe, um, one half of of Latchkey Gallery, and and she's she's definitely that that person, <laughs> she really loves those little cookies, those Maria cookies. Um, so I, I, I wanted to incorporate like a little, a little of her and a little of myself as well in, in the bags. And um, yeah, and I think actually there's, there's some, and then there's products that I know are, are, are points of sort of tension, um, which the, the Maggie products are, are a thing that I know that there's a lot of like there's even protests in, in parts of the Caribbean and in the, in the Dominican Republic because they're really high in salt content. 
people are suffering from diabetes and all sorts of stuff because of these products. And so they're, they're um, in direct you know, conflict with companies that want to take over whole bodegas with their advertisements outside. Um, so there's a lot of brand loyalty that you'll see in communities, which is why you know, the, the head of a corporation can be a complete bigot and they'll still buy that product because it's a, it's, their knowledge is that's good, that's what's good. And that's what's familiar, yeah. Um, and maybe that's what's available. But I also, I remember you telling me that um, someone had called these shrines. And so I think that's an interesting, because they do feel like tributes. And I think it's an, an interesting way to enter, Caitlin, the next, thank you. Um, so, you know, now we're entering um, a small space that um, is part of a larger, the larger mural, which is in the bigger gallery that is adjacent to this space. Um, but this is um, an image of a sidewalk shrine. And it also sign signals um, that ma many of the works that were made now that we're moving through the exhibition were made actually during the pandemic. Whereas the, the works in the small gallery, which from the Mercado series were made from 2017 to 2020, these works now um, were made um, during the pandemic and definitely have, um, are inspired by that experience and under the influence of that experience. Like, I mean, how could we, we're, we've all um, been under, you know, have, have um, bore the effects of um, this global pandemic. So this is, um, I love the way that you make your murals. Um, so what we're looking at, and Lucia, you can just jump in and cut me off, <laughs> but um, is we, the walls are painted a specific palette, you know, according to a specific palette that Lucia has given us in advance. And then the elements that you see there are all vinyl. Um, some of them are cut out and are individually put assembled together. Um, and I thought maybe we could talk about where those images came from, because I think most of them you told me were images that you were looking specifically to looking for on the internet, but actually are, are very much inspired by the sidewalk shrines that you were witnessing um, in your neighborhoods. Um, and this space is very small, very intimate. And so um, I feel like also it's become sort of um, like a grotto. Yeah, so um, the, the shrines that you normally see on the street are, are usually dedicated to, to a specific person and um, someone that the block um, really knew and, and, and saw often, a lot of the times raised on that block. So like neighbors knew this kid since they were small. A lot of the times, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these, these deaths are, are gang affiliated or, or, or things like that. But other times they're not. Sometimes, you know, you'll have someone that, that maybe um, was, you know, was enlisted overseas or, or whatever, whatever the, the case is surrounding the death, um, they'll, they'll have these little shrines. And so people will bring um, something that they really love. So like, whether that's their, their favorite drink or their favorite colors or, you know, so objects in their favorite colors or, or little things like that. And, um, and then there's sometimes, you know, people have little specific prayer cards and, uh, with the person's name or like a photo. And, um, but I started to see more, more than ever before, it, these weren't just shrines for these, for these young men anymore. It was sort of like, you'd see um, some of the older residents who had passed away uh, um, from COVID during this time. And, and it was such a crazy moment especially, you know, because I, I remember doing some heavy grocery shopping and then just staying home for a really long time and going out maybe very early in the morning just for like 
to breathe some fresh air and, and, and really took this like quarantine um, seriously. And, and then there was a point where I was coming out and almost every other block, you know, people were leaving flowers in front of a building. And, and then I traveled to, to my studio and the South Bronx was hit really hard. And um, mostly, you know, this is where my studio is, is, is the poorest congressional district in the country. And so with that, you already have a bunch of folks that are, um, that have pre-existing conditions that got worsened by COVID. And, um, Cause we're right next to the Bruckner, which was built to cut right across um, this area. And so there's a lot of air pollution, high asthma rates. Um, so, you know, I, I, I understood that though this was affecting everyone, this wasn't affecting everyone equally, um, or at least communities uh, equally. And, um, and I wanted to pay tribute in, in some shape or form. And, I wanted to do it in in a respectful way that wasn't um, that wasn't sort of like just a, a passing thought and exploitative. And, and I think um, to to have include to have included this this segment of the mural with the larger mural would have been um, not the right move because it gets lost in sort of all the other things that that you have a moment between these two. Uh, spaces to sort of take in, oh wait, this this looks very much like a kind of funeral. You know, th this is not this is not the same as um, as these other as these other spaces. And so I I used St. Joseph because I had done a little research on the different things that this saint is is used for, and uh, it's used after 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 moments of of either, you know, famine, great atrocity, whatever. And, and he's a patron state of workers. And that was one thing that uh, I also noticed, you know, the disparities of it. So many of these people who were in the front lines and who were workers were the ones greatest at risk. And a lot of those folks were um, people of color. Okay, Caitlin, can we move on to the next gallery? Okay, so this is um, the South, what we call the South Gallery, and it's a very large gallery. And um, I remembered something you said, Lucia, during while we were installing, how it feels like you brought Washington Heights to Ridgefield, Connecticut. And it truly is um, a tribute to your own experience and your hy hybridity. Um, and I was wondering if you could, again, I think, talk a little bit about um, how you chose the imagery that's within the mural itself, um, and also just the process with your murals, because um, this has been ongoing. I, I, I feel as though it's probably been two to three years that you've been working in this way with these room-scaled murals that combine, you know, this colorful kind of fields or grounds of color and then the digitally printed vinyl. Um, so it is like a dimensional, truly a dimensional col collage that is, you know, mimicking or playing off the scale of, of, of a billboard. Yeah. Um, these Kayla, you can go in if you want to, to some other images of the mural, if you want, we can go back. Yeah, so these um these were the the photos for for these murals were all taken um, during my walks during during the pandemic, and and one of the things that I noticed was that anyone who was a street vendor um, was sort of striving in 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 this time because I mean everything. People felt a lot safer shopping outside than they did inside. So, um, a lot of these, a lot of these street vendors um, started making their own uh, hand sanitizers. Started, you know, they were they were really savvy around this time. And I, I just kept thinking about. I, I was talking to one of them, 
and I was like, man, we just, we know how to hack the system. Like every time we, we figure something out, um, a clothing store closes and, and then they take everything out and they start selling it in the street. And, um, and I think even with, uh, even with COVID, like there were so many bodegas that were, that were being incredibly kind with a lot of the things that, uh, with a lot of the products that they had, they were definitely cutting down prices and making sure that people were able to get, you know, I think a lot of them allowed for those, those refrigerators that were outside that were like kind of community refrigerators. And um, I, I felt that though it was a very, you know, sad time and, and rough time that we figured out a way to thrive um, despite what was going on. And so this was, this was one of those things that I wanted to um, sort of pay tribute to was, was that, that neighborhood. And it's sort of like, like the feel of, of what walking through those blocks is as opposed to a complete um, copy and replica of it. Cause they're, they're just a few elements, but um, there's also things that I wanted to include that I know are soon to be relics, right? Like these little gumball machine things. And um, I'm pretty sure that as, as people stop using change, we won't be seeing them very much. Uh, and also I don't, I don't, I haven't seen kids running to them as much as they used to. Um, and then also the for lease signs, which I kept seeing were everywhere. And, um, and what that meant in terms of uh, what was lost, but also uh, what was gained, because there were people that could then later, you know, put their put their stands outside of these closed down locations, especially when they were big big businesses, big brand name businesses that closed um, in those neighborhoods. Uh, these these smaller, you know, there was one that I wanted to include that I didn't get to, but it was such a funny contrast, which was like this jewelry store that closed down and then someone selling like jewelry on the street right in front of it, like cheaper jewelry. And I just was like, this is great. Cause this person's like, awesome. Like I have a sign and everything above me. Um, and so, it's, so I wanted to capture that, that, that feeling in the neighborhood. The color is, the color field in itself is, is again, that's where my painter brain comes in which is that sort of formalism and trying to, to play with what picks, what picks up what color from what when you, when you place it next to the other and, and how your eye moves through this feels very much um, the way that your eye would move looking at a block, a city block. Yeah, I remember you saying that. I really, I love that because then I started, because I lived in the city for 19 years, I started thinking about that and how kind of color, you know, a lot of the buildings, they absorb color, reflect the color, because um, the light kind of is, is just cast in, in the in-between spaces or on the reflective spaces. Um, so, Kaylin, can we move to one of the upholstered pieces? Because as you can see in the mural, oh, this is a good one. Um, there are two, sculptures and, and one in particular, Casita, um, that, is, that is part or at least leaning against almost supported by the mural. And, um, you know, one thing that's very noticeable in the exhibition is that the body is implied everywhere. Obviously, um, we become as visitors kind of complicit in the, within the narrative, but you know, within your work, the figure is um, noticeably not there, noticeably absent. Um, but there is one piece I think um, that, you know, does leave a little bit of a ghostly trace of the, that hints towards some sort of um, potential identity. And that is the upholstered work that's closer to the gates on the green, like green background that you can see there called Essencialmente Essencial. I hope I didn't butcher the pronunciation, Lucia. <laughs> but um, can you talk a little bit about maybe that work? Cause I think it does show the process, which and how these 
upholster works are made and what, and I think you can see the image that um, of the mattress leaning against the, the gate in the city, but just a little bit, I think, um, about where, what was the inspiration for, this is another ongoing series in your practice. Yeah, I, I started to think of um, discarded mattresses as sort of windows into, into the communities that, that, they, that they were thrown out in, um, almost as if you can see through that, that mattress um, what is it framing? And uh, so the, the one, the one on the right here is is right in front of my building in Brooklyn. Um, and I loved it because it was like both things: it was the gates, and then it's also the the mattress leaning on it. Um, I I really love that this very very personal item. I always say that there's a there's a huge difference of um, with communities that are that are very wealthy versus communities that are not, and it's that there's there's something about privacy that is a luxury, and um, when you're stacked on top of each other, when you're uh, when your when your garbage is visible, when you're there's sort of a, there's there's no hiding it, there's no pretty facade, um, you don't you don't have a back entrance to your house, right? There's it, everything's there, everything's out in the open, and um, and I thought the mattress was the best example of that. This is like the most personal thing um, that one has. You lay here. There's some. There's so much that happens on there, and there, there, you know, it's such a such an intimate thing. And um, and when you're in a rush and you have to move or whatever the case, people usually just throw them out. There's 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 no time to call that service that comes and picks it up and recycles it and does the thing. It's, um, and you're lucky if your super is one of those people that, that, is, very, that is very good and, and can expedite that. But, but very often um, that's not the case and they'll be on the block for a really long time till they're all soggy in the rain and then they have to remove them. Um, and so I, I also, thought about that, you know, I, I think I was thinking about this mattress a lot the other days. I'm like, God, it's it's there and it's this sort of eyesore and source of embarrassment for the rest of the, the block. Like everyone was, was just like walking by it like, oh, that thing. And, um, and one of the things that were really jarring to me and still are uh, is a sort of sidewalk structures like we've literally built homes outside of restaurants um and you know we'll be enjoying our, our nice luxury meal and uh a, a, you know a homeless person will come through with their cart with with all of their belongings and stuff in it and um and that real sort of that that rubbing up against that um and whatever that that sort of guilty feeling is, or whatever that that moment is, where you're like, "Oh God," um, is is so what these mattresses are about. You know, that's that's the they're not they're not quite part of the wall. They're not quite part of the mural. They're not they're 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 uh, they're sort of just there. And um, so I wanted to capture the the most sort of uh, the most glaring thing to me, which was the the Uber Eats and uh, the delivery uh, workers, who um, who have been out there, you know, who who rain rain or shine, um, COVID or no COVID, are are, are every day sort of um, with with very low pay, I must say. Um, are out there putting themselves at risk. And um, I didn't want to include the body for the same reason that I don't include the body in other parts of the work, which is if you can fill in the blank, right? If you know who that is, then you know. There's no not knowing, you know, there's no, you can, I have a, I have a sign in the studio that I look at a lot, um, sort of hold myself accountable for a lot of things, personal and, and work-wise. Um, what are you pretending not to know, 
right? What, have you, what are you pretending not to know about the identity of these, of these workers? And so, um, and also thinking about what I had mentioned about the title marginal costs and how a lot of the times we talk about these economies and we don't think about the people. We don't think about the human cost or, or the environmental cost. And so what remains as you're looking in the space is all the stuff. It's, all, it's basically all, all our, our junk, all our stuff. Um, yeah. Well, I think we're at an hour, but we didn't actually get to talk about the gates yet, which is the right. newest sculpture. So maybe we could, which also contain another kind of cultural relic. Um, maybe we quickly, do you think, Lucia, you could give a little yeah, yeah. talk about that? Because I think it's important just to quickly um, talk about these sculptures and there are three of them in the exhibition and they're brand new. Um, so I'll let you jump in. Yeah, so these gates are, are, are such a, you know, it's such a city um, architectural thing. And, and, um, and I wanted to include it in my work for a very long time. I didn't know how, um, and I didn't just wanna incorporate them in, in mural form. I wanted to, to, to really expand on these, on these objects. And, and so this is, the, the one to the right is, um, all, all of my Instagram posts are very uh, cheeky when it comes to my work references, but um, these are all gates in Brooklyn. Some of them are in the South Bronx. Um, I lived in the Bronx for, for a bit and um, every, every Thursday we would have circulars in the morning that were just like either hanging or stuffed in, in the gates. And, and I loved that, that moment, um, especially thinking again about who is doing the delivering of these of these circulars? A lot of these jobs go to um, non English speaking folks, and um, and so I wanted to bring that to a larger scale, like like most of my work. So these are oversized versions of these smaller gates, um, and I I made them with my uh, as you can see, they're they're collaborations with Luigi Ironworks, a part of the museum. That's what it says on all. All the labels uh, and Luigi Ironworks belongs to my father's cousin, um, who I just called Theo Luis. But uh, he he owns this company. He called it Luigi Ironworks because this is normally was a, an Italian um, trade, and and people knew Italians to be really good at this sort of iron business. And and he's like, they're not going to buy it from Dominicans. So so he took his name, Luis turn it to Luigi and that's his, that's his business. And uh, he's in New Jersey. If you, if you need iron works, reach out to Luigi. Well, thank you so much, Lucia. I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation. Um, I certainly learned a lot. And, um, and also I should note that Lucia is in her studio. So you can see some of, you can see her sewing machine and some other materials um, she's surrounded by.